So in this video today, I wanted to go over the one problem that was on the sample exam, um, because now that we've worked through a lot of the material on rotational motion and rigid body motion, we could tackle a problem like this where we have the Atwood machine, which is two masses connected by a cord hanging over a pulley. But if you remember, in, when we first were introduced to this scenario, we always stressed the fact that the pulley was, was frictionless, which means that we weren't really speaking about the resistance of the pulley to rotation. And, and then if you think about that, that means that we really weren't thinking about its moment of inertia of the pulley and how that might factor into the whole scenario. So just to remind you what, what the setup is, I have these two masses. Mass two is heavier than mass one. So the idea, of course, is if we start with mass two up in the air with some height, that if we release it from rest, it of course will fall, mass one will rise. And we wanted to figure out what the final speed of the system would be. What would be the speed of mass two when it hits the ground, which of course would be the same as the speed of mass one as it attains the initial height that mass two had. But we also have to think about the fact that as those masses are moving, the pulley is rotating and it will have rotational kinetic energy and we're gonna include that in this scenario. So we're gonna start off with the same idea, conservation of energy, where the energy could be thought of as two different types, kinetic and potential. And let's think about what our initial situation is and what our final situation is. So initially, mass two is at a height of h off the ground. Nothing is moving. The initial velocity of the whole system is zero. That means the pulley isn't rotating either. So the kinetic energy of the system initially is zero. It, there is a potential energy equal to m2gh. And so that's what we have initially. So basically, this defines the total quantity of energy that the system has. That quantity of energy is going to remain constant, but it can be split up in different ways among different buckets, if you will. Now, after the pulley, after the mass falls and right before it hits the ground, the kinetic energy is going to be due to both of the masses moving. So we can put them together because they have to have the same velocity because they're attached. And so we could write the uh, translational kinetic energy, 1 half mv squared, using m1 plus m2 as our mass. Now the thing that we want to include is now we have the kinetic energy of the pulley, which is going to be 1 half i omega squared, where i is the moment of inertia of the pulley. And then finally, m1 is going to ra raise to that initial height of h, and so we have potential energy of mgh. Now, let's simplify this a little, and let's just think about how we could solve for the final velocity. So I'm just, nothing's going to happen over here, but I'm going to make some changes to show how we sort of combine rotational quantities with translational quantities. First of all, for the moment of inertia of the pulley, you know, there's some different possibilities. Sometimes you're just told what the rotational inertia or the moment of inertia of the object is. A lot of times we treat the pulley as a disk and we know that its moment of inertia of a disk is one half m r squared. I'm gonna use a capital M to note the um, mass of the pulley and capital R you can see in the labeled is the radius. Now the angular velocity of the pulley, so everything's going to rotate like this, but remember that that angular velocity is going to be related to the linear velocity of the masses through that factor of R. So we could actually put in here V over R and that's squared. So that's omega squared and then plus M1GH. 
So a little tight on space, but that's, this will happen. Okay, so now I can, you can see that I have a situation where I could, oh, and this is the final velocity too. Um, I could actually now potentially solve for the final velocity. I'm gonna do a little bit more simplification before I go for that. Um, here, I'm gonna get M2GH minus M1GH is equal to one half M1 plus M2 V squared. And then this is going to be equal to 1 fourth mr squared times v, v squared, v final squared over r squared. And so you see that the r's are going to cancel out in this. I've got to use the right notation, the same notation for both my final velocities. So let's again factor out a little bit more or make it a little bit more fancy. m2 minus m1 times gh is equal to, and then I'm gonna factor out the V final squared. I'm gonna get one half, the M1 plus M2, and then also a one fourth of the mass of the pulley. So I'm gonna just put this over here. V final, I'm just gonna do V final squared. You know that we would take the square root to find the final, final term is going to look like this. And so that's how we would find the final velocity. If you wanted to sort of think about it, think about how this might have looked if we didn't include the pulley. If we didn't include the pulley, we would basically just kind of get rid of this term, the 1 fourth m. And so if I don't have that term in the uh, denominator, then that means that the final velocity would be a little faster, which I think everyone kind of worked through logically when they were going over that pretest that um, adding the rotational kinetic energy of the pulley basically meant that this initial energy was split up into an extra bucket. And so that means that each of the other buckets get less. And so in the end, our final speed is not going to be as high as it was when we ignored the pulley. Um, so just thought it'd be good to work through that and to see how we might approach it. Also, um, you could imagine, you know, not using the pulley and you could still sort of see how we work through this problem.